Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our travel talk. This morning, we have Wendy Martin, who's familiar to many of you. She's done many a talk for us, both online and in the hall, but we used to do them at the College of Adult Education. And Wendy has come to talk to us today about Namibia and Botswana. And she also, I'm sure, mentioned the charity Thunder Cow that she is an ambassador for. So uh, welcome to all of you on YouTube who are watching this. And over to you, Wendy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here again, albeit in these strange circumstances. Um, <laughs> deltas and dunes. We did this and we're not entirely sure when. We think it was in 2002, which was before we, before we both retired. And so we didn't have a digital camera in those days. So we had to go to one of our old uh, photograph albums and scan everything, which took ages. But anyway, we've done it. One of the things I've noticed, I, I had no idea in those days that I've been doing talks like this and some of the photographs would be very different. For instance, we haven't got any photographs of our leader and our driver. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> but if I was doing that now, of course, I'd take very different photographs. So you'll have to bear with us. Right. So we'll share the screen and get started. Right. So as you probably know, most of you, I'm involved with Sendacow. I got involved just after I retired, which was in 2004 and became an ambassador. And uh, we don't work in either of the countries I'm talking about this morning, but as I'm sure you know, the pandemic is hitting all the African countries very hard. So any donations from this talk will be very gratefully received. And it's just a wooden frame with a plastic bottle and a foot lever. And the foot lever tips the bottle up, it's got a small hole in it, and it's a simple way of keeping clean. And there you can see some of our staff in Uganda giving out hand sanitizers. So they are trying very hard, but of course it's much harder than it is in this country without clean water. So 13 pounds would provide a tip tap and hygiene training. 60 pounds would provide additional life saving skills, etc. So we traveled with travel by the holidays. I don't think they even exist now. But we started off at Windhoek in Namibia, drove into Botswana, through the Okavango Delta, then back into Namibia. As you probably know, when I do a talk, I usually bring lots of books for you to look at. So I'll put them on my screen. The Africa book is brilliant. It's a Lonely Planet book, and it has uh, information about every one of the African countries. And this one, Roaring at the Dawn, is specifically about um, the Kalahari and Botswana. So that one was brilliant for information. So Botswana, size of France, a vast sand-filled basin, and the Kalahari covers about 85% of it. After the first Boer War, it, it became a British protectorate, and then it became independent in 1966. Um, important economically for diamonds, and it has a progressive healthcare system, but unfortunately, about 40% of the population are living with um, HIV AIDS. So we flew into Windhoek Airport, a very big cosmopolitan airport, and we met our driver and our guide, and there were eight of us, all um, British, and we were traveling in this vehicle, and on the back, we had our trailer with um, everything we could need, our tents, our food, our mattresses, everything we needed. Now, it was important, Botswana was important because it was part, it was part of the corridor for the Cape to Cairo Railway, which was never finished. Uh, the idea came up in 1874, and it was uh, proposed by the editor of the Daily Telegraph. And then, of course, Cyril Ro Cecil Rhodes took it on. 
And we've all, all heard the horrible stories about people being picked off by lions as they were building the railway. It was never finished and it was never operational. So it's a big waste of money really, but there we are. Uh, so we're traveling through the Kalahari and we saw this very sleepy aardvark. It was the first one I'd ever seen. And it was just magical. It was, uh, the sun was shining through its big ears and it just sort of ambled around. It was wonderful to see it. And then we stopped in a village and uh, this village was one of the old San Bushman villages, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we met a group who took us out into the bush and showed us some of their skills. Uh, another of my books is this one by Lauren van der Post. And I'll just read you what he says and uh, what it says about it in the back. Lauren van der Post was deeply distressed by the fate of this remarkable people. Ostracized by the changing face of African cultural life, they retreated deep into the Kalahari desert. His fascinating attempt to capture their way of life and the secrets of their ancient heritage provide captivating reading and a unique insight into a forgotten way of life. So it was great to go out with them and learn a little bit about it, about their hunting skills, their poison arrows, their traps, etc. And then we traveled on and we came across the first baobab trees and uh, I'm rather fond of baobab trees for various reasons. I got some information about them. It's often called the tree of life. And of course, it's this very strange upside down tree. When we were in Tanzania, I think, we saw one that had been completely destroyed by elephants in a drought. They'd um, taken all the bark off it and they were extracting the water from the inside. It's adapted to its environment. It absorbs and stores water in its large trunk. And it provides a nutrient rich fruit, which is here. And uh, this fruit can be made into a soup. It's called monkey bread. The leaves can be made into a soup as well. It's a source of cream of tartar. And a study showed that women living in the vicinity of baobab trees actually produce more children because of the nutrients they got from the leaves. Um, it compensates for dietary deficiencies. So now we know. There's a Bushman legend about the god Thora who got fed up with the baobab tree taking all the light in his garden. So he pulled it up, chucked it over his wall, and it landed down below on the earth. But unfortunately, it landed upside down. But never mind, it took root. And uh, that's why it always looks like a strange upside down tree. People believe that if you picked a baobab flower, you'd be eaten by a lion. But if you drank water with baobab seeds in it, you'd be safe from crocodile pit crocodile attack. So there you are, take your pick. We drove through Morn, which was quite a cosmopolitan town, but I've already mentioned AIDS. We went there during National Condom Week, which we hadn't been aware of until then, but uh, there were rallies in the streets, there was a lorry with loud hailers, and they were giving out carrier bags of free condoms. So that was quite interesting. And of course, it's a drive to control the spread. So here we are, we came across from Namibia up to Morn, and then after that, we were in the Delta. And uh, a bit of information about the Delta, it's in the north of the country. The capital Gaborone is down here. The Delta is the Okavango River, which comes down from the highlands of Angola. And during the rainy season, it floods. And the flood goes a different way every year. Apparently it never goes the same way. It just sort of floods the whole of the area. Um, and it turns away to the Atlantic, strangely. Uh, no, it doesn't. It turns away from the Atlantic and flows into the Indian Ocean, which I'm never quite sure about, but there it is. Um, and the Indian Ocean is nearly 2,000 miles away, so goodness knows why it does that. But uh, when the floods are up, they divide the delta into lots of different small islands. And as I said, the landscape changes every year. And that's an aerial view of it, absolutely stunning. So we went to a campsite. Uh, we'd, been, we'd been driving through the Kalahari. Then we came to the edge of the delta and we set up camp in this lovely 
campsite run by a South African family with three children. And of course, they had lots of stories to tell us. One of the first things they showed us was the enclosed area in the water uh, that they built for their children to swim in safely because, of course, there are crocodiles and hippos and all sorts in the water. And this compound was to allow the children to swim safely and their dogs as well. The dogs had learned that that was the safest place to go in. So there we are setting up our campus, Trevor, at our tent. And this is another view of the site. There was a, a sheltered area here where we ate. And um, there was also a large chest, <coughs> a sort of ice box with drinks to help yourself into. And there was a book on the top where you could record um, what drinks it had. And then we paid at the end. And I think our bill, our bill was higher than anyone else's, which is not something to be proud of. But anyway, it was a lovely sight. And we went out with our host. This is our um, South African host. He pronounced his name Guy, and he took us out into the Delta. He had with him a little, what he called a pen gun, and it was stuck in his top pocket. And he told us that any problems with animals, it uh, flashes and makes a loud bang. But uh, we never saw him use it, we never had to. And there you can see the delta, absolutely beautiful. All these high papyrus reeds. We went out in his boats. I think there were two boats, if you remember, two motor boats. And as the sun was setting, we came back from that afternoon trip. And as the sun was setting, he was taking us out again. So that's two of our people on the jetty. And then we're all <coughs> gathering, waiting for the boat to come. Beautiful sunset. And then we're out in the boats, just as the sun's going down. Got a searchlight. Oh yes, that's right. He had a searchlight on uh, each of the boats. And we were looking at all these um, eyes and the papyrus and suddenly he dived out of the boat and sees this baby crocodile, which was really interesting. And uh, we all had a good look at it and got to take a photograph. And then, of course, he let it go again. But there were all sorts of strange eyes and we could hear hippos. We didn't actually see any hippos at that time, but we could hear them all around us. And he told us the story of once when he was out with his um, staff and they were in the Makoros, which are the small boats. And they were out late afternoon, I think, and they were attacked by a hippo, which overturned all the Makoros. They were all in the water. Guy decided to dive down and uh, keep out of the way. And the others scrambled back into the boats, shouted for Guy, couldn't find him. So they very hastily paddled away and they went back and told Guy's wife that he was dead. And she wouldn't accept that. She said, no, no, you've got to go and find him or at least bring his body back. And so they went back to where the accident had happened, and there was Guy sitting on the bank, soaking wet, waiting for them. So it had a happy ending. So we left there, and Guy told us also that um, he had a lot of horses. And during a certain time of year, I don't know what it was, all the horses were driven down to the south of the country where there was better grazing. And he told us how they lit fires all the way around to keep lions away from them. And he said he gets a lot of young English girls on Magapia, uh, these girls who are horse mad, and they come to work with his horses. And then they take part in the ride home, which sounds really exciting when they ride the horses back from the south, back up to Guy's place in the north, in the Delta. And he said long after these girls have been and worked for him, he still gets emails from them saying, can we come for the ride home? And lots of them do, sadly not this year, but uh, some girls come back every year. So there we are loading up the Macoros to go out into the Delta. There you can see our mattresses and the spade there and various other things. I wish now I had taken a photograph of the toilet sitting resplendent on the front of one of the boats. We had a toilet with no bottom and everywhere we went, they dug out a, 
a deep hole roof for our pig latrine and we had a toilet tank. So there you can see all the stuff loaded up and there's our, I don't know what they call them, polars I think, I think so, yeah. um, guiding the boat. Another view with our cool box. Very uncomfortable things to sit in because they're so low down and uh, they feel quite unstable. Sorry, I'm going too fast. <laughs> so lovely view, that's Trevor at the back of this boat. And uh, I think we had about five boats all together carrying us. Another view. And that was uh, a lovely chap, I can't remember his name now. It's so long ago, but he, uh, he was very nice. And we kept in touch with him for a while afterwards. And then we landed on an island. And we went to a couple of islands and walked around. And for some reason, the polars said, no, they weren't suitable. And with one of them, I said, well, why isn't it suitable? I couldn't quite see. And he said, come with me. And he took us to the edge of the island. And there were some sort of slide marks on the bank. And he said, this is where the crocodiles come up. And it's very recent. So I could quite see why that island wasn't suitable. But anyway, we kept going and we landed on another island and we set up camp. This one evidently was suitable. So we had a safety check. Everybody walked around looking for snakes and things. They were beating the undergrowth. There's Trevor doing his bit. And then we decided this one was all right. So we started setting up the camp and there's Trevor helping to dig the uh, pig latrine out. And there you can see our camps, our tents. A big fire was lit on the outside of the camp and the polars just slept in the open uh, some distance away from us. They caught fish for us every day, so we had the most beautiful fresh fish. It was absolutely really fresh and tasty. And there you can see the lip on the tent. Very important uh, to stop snakes and things getting in. And of course, you always, always have to zip your tent up when you go to sleep at night. Apparently, animals don't recognize that there are people inside the tent, so I don't quite know why but uh, that's what they always tell us anyway. And <laughs> we've never had any frightening incidents. Red lechwe, um, very specialized type of antelope. They've got waterproof legs and they've got um, large splayed hoofs so they don't sink into the mud. Lots of elephants in our first camp, I think they said there were elephants around, so they built a very large fire and the following morning we went out and followed the elephants which was quite exciting now you can see a water tower there were quite a few of these on the islands um this goliath crane we didn't know what was wrong with it it was clearly injured in some way and the polars picked it up and examined it but they couldn't see anything wrong with it so really they just had to let it just leave it and let it go. I don't know whether they went back afterwards and put it out of its misery. It was rather sad. There's one of them examining it. And then the elephants. In one of our camps, they told us there were elephants around. Next morning, we got up and followed them at a distance. Nobody seemed to have a gun. Um, a lot of the men had large sticks. And I've mentioned Guy's pen gun, but that's all we had, as far as I know. We might have had concealed weapons, but I'm certainly thunder not aware of them. A thunder flash, that's right. So we followed the elephants at the same safe distance. I'm sure they knew we were there, but they didn't seem to mind. And then the elephant stopped to graze, and one of the men climbed up onto this rock. And he told us to climb up one at a time, very carefully, and just poke our heads over the top, which we did. And there were the elephants grazing peacefully on the other side. It's a magical moment for me. 
and then they wandered off again. Communal weavers, we've seen these all over the place. Often um, the branch breaks when it gets so big, they all have their nests in there. We did see a broken one, didn't we, somewhere lying on the ground. And then there were lots of uh, other weavers. These are individual nests all over the place. A nest there with eggs in, um, they did tell us what it was. I can't remember now what it was, but look at the camouflage. Terrific, isn't it? Another island, <clears throat> unloading all the gear. It took quite some time to get loaded up and unloaded. And then it was time to go. So we went back to Guy's place, picked up our vehicle and we were off. Okay, thank you. One thing I forgot to mention, when I was talking about the Okavango Delta, um, I think it was about a month ago, there was an article, a bit in our paper, and it was headed, Mystery as 400 Elephants Die. The death of more than 400 elephants who collapsed in Botswana has baffled experts. Uh, no signs of poaching, no signs of poisoning. At first they blamed anthrax, but then that's since been ruled out. And they just don't know why these elephants died. It's very sad um, because Botswana has a third of Africa's declining elephant population. So it's still being investigated, but I haven't heard anything else, which is very sad about it. Anyway, there we are. Wow. Okay. Right. So we crossed over uh, the Caprivi Strip and into into um, Namibia. And as we were going along, we stopped to get supplies in a village and there were these young lads in a, in a vehicle. And when they saw my camera, they all jumped out and said, take our photograph. And Trevor was very worried about that. He said, no, no, you shouldn't be taking photographs of the military. But they were very young and they seemed very good humored and they all posed in silly poses. So I did take a photograph of them. And uh, they, because it wasn't a digital camera, they couldn't see the photograph, but they didn't seem to mind that. They just got back in their vehicle and waved and drove off. So it wasn't as uh, daunting as it first sounded, but Trevor was very concerned about taking photos of the military. Sorry? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, they were from Angola, which made it even more frightening. But they seemed quite young and innocent, so no harm done, I don't think. So here we are from the Caprivi Strip, which is there, down into Namibia. And I've got a bit of information about Namibia here. Very harsh climate, uh, the Namib Desert and the coastal plains in the west. There's a central plateau and the Kalahari, which borders onto Namibia and Botswana. It was annexed by Germany in the late 19th century and then disputed for a long, long time before it finally got independence in 1990. The economy is driven by minerals. Um, it's the fifth largest producer of uranium in the world. And there's also lead, zinc, tin, silver and tung tungsten. And in the bottom southwest down here, there's a large De Beers diamond mining concession. And they also export large amounts of salt and sand. I don't know where they export them to, I'm sure. Um, some of the world's grandest national parks, including Atosha, which is in the north that we went to, and the dune fields around Sausage Play down here, which we also visited. Uh, ten major tribal groups, uh, including the San, who sadly are now dying out. So this was more or less our trip from Windhoek round to Bourne, through the Okavango, along the Caprivi Strip. And then it's a bit vague after that because we're not entirely sure, but we, we covered this sort of area and then back to Namibia. So we visited the petrified forest and I've got a little bit of information about this. Uh, 
It's on the road C39 and it's large tree trunks which have turned to stone through a process called diagenesis. Diagenesis, sorry. I don't quite know how it's pronounced. I got that from the internet. It's believed they were swept downstairs by a large flood and then buried in sand more than 200 million years ago. And they were discovered by these two farmers. I can't imagine what they first thought about them. But now, of course, it's a national monument and tourists go to see them. So that's a part of one of these petrified tree trunks. And that's another one. It looks as if it's been sawn into sections, doesn't it? That it was cracked. Oh, it's cracked. Yes, it's cracked all the way through. But uh, quite amazing to see them. And you notice in the background these strange plants, which I'll talk about in a, a few minutes. Here we are. Well, Wichia mirabil mirabilis is one of the world's rarest plants. And I looked this up on the internet because recently on the radio, I heard somebody talking about this plant. And she told me that the RHS had had a competition to find the world's ugliest plant. And this came in third. Now, I've been on the RHS website and couldn't find any reference to it, so I don't know whether that's true or not. Apparently, number one was the corpse flower, which I haven't yet managed to look up, but I will in due course. I have no idea what number two was, but apparently this is the third. And it's said to be one of the world's ugliest plants. Looks like a messy pile of half-dead kelp attached to a bulbous woody trunk looks like a malignant growth. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Anyway, it's endemic to the Namib Desert and it was named after Friedrich Wellwich, who discovered the plant in 1859. And some are said to be between 1,000 and 1,500 years old. They have a very long taproot. You can go down and find water. And it's described as a plant that's been run over by a dozen four by fours. It's also on the coat of arms of Namibia. So there we are. And we saw them all over the place, didn't we? And that's another picture looking like seaweed. So we camped near Twyfold Fontaine. And um, this was the, I think this was the campsite we went to and then we were allocated space. There was a little market there and we set up our camp again. It's probably the picture you saw before, I think. And <clears> then <throat> we visited the rock engravings, and here is the entrance to it. And what was it Trevor said? What does that it's remind you of? What, what kind of emblem does it remind you of? Yes. <laughs> jaguar. And of course, it's the um, logo on the front of the Jaguar. So it's known as the Lion's Mouth Rock, and it's the entrance. And <coughs> this site has world heritage status. It's ancient rock paintings and engravings believed to be part of the rituals of the sand bushmen. And they're related to their hunter-gathering communities. So they were found, off, usually found near water sources where people gathered, sharing the water with lions, zebra, all sorts of animals, and their cattle as well. So we started off at the entrance and walked in and we found all these rock paintings, absolutely beautiful, the giraffe there, don't quite know what some of them were. These are much clearer, there's a lion look, that looks like a rhinoceros, um, not in proportion I must say, and a giraffe there and various other things. It's just wonderful to see them, very, very clear. These strange symbols, I've no idea what they meant. But they, they were obviously man-made. And we explored, you can see lots of people in different places around. We could wander around all day, I think. Mm -hmm. Fascinating place. And lots of little crannies in the rock where you could go. And this is one of my favourite books. 
Um, it's a love story, which is a bit naff, I suppose, but it's got brilliant descriptions of Namibia and the terrain and the indigenous people. So it's a, a really interesting book. And then we went to Etosha National Park. We were told that if you're not back in by a certain time, the gates are closed and you don't get in no matter what. So if you arrive late, you have to sleep in your vehicle outside the gate. I don't know how true that is because we didn't put it to the test, but there you are. Lots of children around by the entrance, just watching us. And we saw this beautiful wooden carving a person and a crocodile. Look at those teeth. They're amazing. And I think there were some more along the road. Um, people were selling them. And here we are getting out of our vehicle. I think we were allocated a campsite. Right. And, and hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sorry, uh, I could hear somebody talking. Anyway, we were allocated a campsite and we set up and then we went to the um, viewing platform. And I had a rather frightening moment because I'd written a letter to my daughter and decided to walk back to the entrance to post it. And uh, it was further than I thought. It was getting dark when I came back. And all the campsites looked the same, and I wasn't sure which was ours. So I had to go around the campsite, sort of whispering where our new our tent was, saying, Trevor, Trevor, are you there? <laughs> I found it eventually, but it was quite a frightening moment because uh, it got dark while I was away, and Trevor had gone to bed. <laughs> but I did find it in the end. And there we are, getting our food ready. We ate very well. It was uh, simple food, but pretty good usually. There's Trevor and some of the girls with us. And that was our driver. Uh, I think it's about the only photograph we've got of him. And unfortunately, I can't remember his name, which is a, a shame. Hyena wandering around. I'm very fond of hyenas. We were once in Kenya and we were taken out to some mud pools in the evening. We had to wait till the local people had left. They'd been bathing in the pools. So we had to wait till they left. Then we got into this uh, very warm mud and we were listening and we could hear hyenas up on the hills. And our guide said, suddenly the, the noise changed. And our guide said, listen, can you hear the difference? And we said, yes. And he said, that means they've killed. So they're calling the tribe in to their kill. It was absolutely fascinating. And then, of course, I had nightmares all night about a hyena coming to the tent to get us. This was fascinating. The giraffes, they all stood on the edge of the water and they looked around for a long, long time. There's another one just in the distance there coming towards the water. And it took them a long, long time looking around before they would actually bend down to drink because of course, once they're in this position, it's quite dangerous for them. And it takes them a long time to get down and get back up again. But uh, very interesting to watch them. There was a lion, I think, wasn't there? In the mm. distance, we could see a lion a long, long way away. We could see it with binoculars. And they were obviously aware that it was there. Elephants again, that's a man-made uh, water hole, look, you can see concrete around the edge of it. Look how barren everything looks. And here we've got oryx with their long spiral horns. And our guide told us that the oryx are very clever. <coughs> he said they're rather lazy beasts. They will hide on the trees until you get near, and then they'll come out and kill you. So we were in the vehicle, so we didn't have to worry about that. Apparently there's an Arabian oryx as well. Uh, they're indigenous here, and there's another, I suppose, subspecies somewhere in Arabia. Apart from that, I don't think they exist anywhere else. I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, interesting looking animals. 
And this was our water hole in the camp. It was all wired off, look, and there were a viewing platform. We went there when it got dark and uh, there was a, a family of rhino that came every night. Trevor says there were eight of them. So it was fascinating to watch them. They came in very cautiously and then they just drank and wandered around and wandered up again. We didn't see much else. I think a couple of hyenas came, but there wasn't much else at the time we were there. We were told of um, a leopard, I think, that had been in the camp at some point. And uh, people have been very worried about it, but there was no sign of it when we were there. This overlander, we saw lots of them up and down the roads. Uh, <coughs> people from all over the world traveling. This one was going north to south. There were some English people on it. They stopped at our camp and we had a chat with them. And uh, it sounds horrendous. They travel for long periods. They sleep in the back there. I looked it up and this was another type of overlander, uh, a different one because of course they have tents in this one and they don't sleep in it. But all their gear is packed in the bottom and they sit in the top. And as I say, they just drive and drive for very long periods. Not my idea of a holiday, I have to say. And then we went to a little airstrip to pick up a, a plane to the Skeleton Coast. <coughs> and the Skeleton Coast is uh, mentioned in that book I've just shown you. So we boarded our plane. I can't remember how many were in each. Mm -hmm. Four in each. So we must have had two planes. And we flew over the sand dunes. Amazing views. That's the other one? Yes, that's the other one. And look at the sand dunes there, just stretching for miles and miles and miles. It's called the Skeleton Coast because there are a lot of shipwrecks. And we couldn't get any pictures of one, so I got that from the internet. But uh, there were several, we saw several, didn't we, on the way. Salt pans. I don't know why they're pink, but they were. Um, miles and miles of them. And they're obviously saving the salt and then it's exported to wherever they send it to. Diego Cao, I don't know how it's pronounced, but uh, he discovered Cape Cross and he was looking for a sea route to reach the Indies. Cape fur seals, the smell here was absolutely horrendous. You couldn't believe it. But we stayed for quite a long time watching the seals. It was very interesting. They told us there were great white sharks off the shore, but unfortunately we didn't see any of them. We didn't see any sharks at all, but apparently they are there. And the seals weren't doing anything much. They were just flopping around, smelling awful, really. <laughs> Uh, we did watch one or two of them get into the sea, but they were a bit half-hearted about it, I think. Swakopmund, a very interesting architecture. It's a German architecture, lovely church there. And we stayed in one of these rather strange houses. I think we had the room at the top, yeah, didn't we? Yes, A-frame houses. Um, very well built and quite attractive. And there's our vehicle, that must have been the one we were staying in. And as you can see, it's a strange construction. And that's me posing outside. And that's a postcard. Beautiful buildings. Very intricate, a lot of them. Herrero ladies. Um, we saw these ladies, beautiful national dress in Botswana and Namibia, but they very clearly didn't want to be photographed. You can tell, can't you, when you walk towards someone with a camera. And so we didn't. I got these from the internet. But uh, I looked it up online. They're a Bantu ethnic group. Uh, the majority are in Namibia, but there are some also in Botswana and Angola. They speak, oh dear, 
or G Herrera, which is a Bantu language. I don't want to get into politics, but again, they've been badly treated in the early part of the 20th century. But now they seem to be living there quite happily. And absolutely stunning um, dress, these very strange flat hats and beautiful dresses almost look as if they're hooped, don't they? And then we went to Sosle and walked in the Namib Desert. Oldest desert in the world, just miles and miles of sand dunes, nothing else as far as the eye can see. The biggest sand dunes in the world. And uh, <coughs> we walked through them during the day and then we set up our camp. And at night we went up to see, watch the sunset. And that was quite stunning, as you can imagine. It was hard work walking on them because the sand was very soft. Um, hard work going up, quite easy coming down because you're virtually sliding down. But we enjoyed it. And some other views there. That's me. I think that's Trevor on top, on top of one of them. Hard work on dry sand. Yes. And uh, that's the rest of our group. And I think there was another group there as well. And we just wandered around. I think we spent the day walking on them. And then, as I said, we went up again at night. So it was uh, wonderful. So we're on our way back now. And we're on this very, very lonely, empty road where <laughs> we had a strange experience. Our vehicle broke down, the shackle pin keeping the, uh, attaching the trailer to the vehicle broke somehow. And so we couldn't pull the trailer. And we're on this very, very isolated uh, bit of road. So we thought we'd wait for a vehicle to come along and see if they could help us. So we sat by the side of the road while the driver and the guide conferred. And I think they were panicking a bit, deciding what to do. No vehicles came along, we waited ages. And then suddenly a man came over the dunes, came over here somewhere, nothing else in sight. He came wandering towards us and the driver explained what the problem was, showed him the chuckle pin and he said, I've got one of those. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. He went wandering off again and it was about an hour later wasn't yeah. it, that he came back. So we were sitting there waiting and uh, we decided to have our dinner while we waited for him. Just sat by the roadside, absolutely nothing passed us at all while we were there. But eventually this bloke came back and he had a new shack of pain. I don't know where he got it. He had a bag full of them, that's right. And so we got the right size shack of pain and set it up. And I don't, didn't see what they paid him. I know they gave him a loaf of bread and some water and uh, there was money changed hands, but I have no idea what it was. And so eventually we were on our way again. It was amazing, I couldn't believe it. But uh, it's a pretty, pretty brilliant thing to happen. Really. And uh, it was just one of the exciting things that happened on our trip. So back to Windhoek. I think we spent the day there didn't we, before we left in the evening. Um, spectacular buildings. That was a little castle there. I don't know the history of Windhoek. I'm sure there's quite a lot of interesting, interesting things I could tell you about it if I knew them. So back to Windhoek, spent the day there looking at the buildings, which were rather beautiful. And then sadly, we had to leave and fly home, which was a real shame because we'd enjoyed it. Uh, we did keep in touch with some of the people we'd been with for a time, but it never lasts. You know, you don't see them again. And I think we, we exchange Christmas cards and things for a, a year or two, and then it just dies out, which is rather a shame. But a last sunset there over the dunes. I think we spent three three nights in the sand dunes. It's just wonderful. The whole atmosphere of the place, very silent. We went out with a guide. We went out with a guide uh, who walked with us in the dunes and he was showing us some very strange little plants that we'd have missed completely. And uh, they have their roots very deep down. 
and we saw some marks in the sand, that's right, from um, snakes and, and lizards, yes. Uh, he could tell what everything was just from the marks in the sand. Fascinating to see them. I don't know why we didn't take pictures of them, but we didn't at the time. Um, and the lizard, he could tell, no, it wasn't a lizard, it was a, a desert little rat, I think. And he could tell marks where its tail had been as it hopped along. It was quite fascinating. So there we are, the end of my, my uh, presentation. Thank um, you very much indeed, Wendy. That was really fabulous. Thank you.